Hi, this is Bob Scully, and welcome to another edition of The World Show, The Entrepreneur Series. In a few minutes, you will meet an engineer who will build you an airport if you want, or if you prefer a hockey arena. No project is too complex nor too daunting for him and his colleagues, as you'll discover. But first, we travel to the world of finance, and specifically, the non-bank lending sector. Just as people yearn, we've all heard this, yearn for good doctors who not only know their science and can cure you, but have a good bedside manner, and unfortunately, there's less and less of them, similarly, entrepreneurs yearn for good lenders, people who have a good balance sheet manner. Of course, they know the numbers, and they'll get you over the goal line, but along the way, they won't be depressing disciplinarians. They won't be predatory people who loan to own. They'll encourage you. They'll make it happen. One such gentleman is Robert Goodall, who's widely considered Canada's premier non-bank lender. And he didn't even think he'd work in that sector. Here's Robert Goodall. Robert Goodall, uh, something caught my eye in the, in the research. Atrium's a great success story, and we'll get into it. But at some point, you say, like most entrepreneurs, I got into it for negative rather than positive reasons. Interesting, what, what happened? Well, I was working at Royal Trust. My career was going very well. After about four years there, I was running the Real Estate Lending Group for Canada. And that was in 1990. But by 1992 and 93, the recession had hit full force and Royal Trust, primarily because of its international acquisitions, was in trouble. And it was clear they were going to get broken up and ultimately they were in part sold to Royal Bank and in part ultimately sold to Brookfield. And I thought it was my time to leave. I was 35 years old at the time and uh, I was in sort of a good position financially and uh, age-wise to uh, start a company on my own. And you went into a sector uh, which we, which is, we hear the term all the time, we don't really think about it, non-bank lending. But non-bank lending is not uh, paycheck uh, cashing uh, at the corner store. It's, right. it's a pretty big uh, industry. Um, what is non-bank lending? Well, it's, it's, it's basically the loans that the banks and the life insurance companies uh, don't do. And it's a real opportunity in Canada because you have such an oligopoly in the financial industry. You have six banks controlling 70 to 80 percent of the deposits in Canada, mm -hmm. and there's and roughly 60 to 70 percent of all the lending in Canada. And there's a real opportunity for a non-bank lender who will take slightly more risk, and you get very well paid for it in Canada. So our rates average 8.7 percent versus a bank which would be in the three to four percent yeah, range. That is, a and yet our our risk profile is just incrementally slightly higher than what they are. We got into it because for a long time, when I, after I left Royal Trust, I was just doing mortgage brokerage, which means I was acting as an intermediary between the lender and the developer. And occasionally, we would do deals with the non-bank lenders. Well, non-bank lenders back then were basically retired developers with a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. They were very difficult to deal with. Often they were predatorial, so they had one eye on the real estate. Loan and to own. Loan to own, that's what they were. <laughs> And we thought, there's a real opportunity here for a professional, full-time lender who, who, who uh, actually wants to lend to the developers, doesn't want the real estate back, and runs more like a financial institution. Now that industry has really grown, but back in 2001 when we started, it was really in its infancy. And in 1994, when I first left Royal Trust, it barely existed. And it seems to me that the, the banks, it looks like a hang-up on their part or a cultural problem because if you're going to get double the interest to cover that extra risk, even a bank should say, okay, I'll go for that. If it's double my interest, what can I lose? What could I possibly lose? But they don't touch it. No, they have very narrow lending criteria. For instance, banks in Canada do a lot of construction lending, mostly in the residential and multi-residential areas. That's what they know, that's what they understand, they stick to that. So there are all sorts of other areas where we can penetrate the market. Also, banks generally have fairly inexperienced lenders working for them at the very top, at the senior vice president level, they might have someone of, of my experience with 25 years of experience, but not mm -hmm. below that. And our, our company, for instance, has five individuals with more than 25 years of lending experience, all of whom are vice presidents or higher at a major financial institution. So we have an ability and an understanding of real estate that ironically goes far beyond what a normal bank would have.
And uh, you have, of course, your own criteria. The, you, you, the, the way Atrium states it is, uh, you you take on loans that the banks won't in the real estate area. But that's that's still a vast uh, possibility. You narrow it down based on what do you kick the tires? You go see the projects. Uh, what are your criteria? Uh, we generally won't go over 75% loan to value, so our criteria on a value basis is very similar to what the banks and life companies would lend on. A lot of times it's speed of transaction. A developer may see an opportunity to buy a piece of real estate, but the vendor needs to close in two weeks. There's no way in the world a bank or a life company can close that quickly, but we can. Mm. And it's not that we don't do as much due diligence, it's just that we do it much more quickly because we have more experienced people working uh, in our group. And we don't have as many layers to get an approval. We go to the board for all of our approvals, but we get that approval within 24 to 48 hours every time. Can you sniff a good deal? After all these, that is experience, isn't it? Yeah. Can you say between two, I don't know, office towers, now this is a dog, this is going to work? Yeah, after 25 years, you have a sixth sense of what works and what doesn't work. Also, because I was running World Trust Mortgage Portfolio uh, for Canada in the recession of 92, 93, which I don't think we'll ever see anything quite like that in real estate for the rest of my career anyway, you learn what works in a down market and what doesn't work. And so we're actually very conservative, mm -hmm. but we do have a sense of, of what has good liquidity and good markets and bad. And as a lender, you're focused on the downside. You're not so focused on the upside. The, the developer enjoys the upside, but it's the downside that we have to protect. And your upside is in a way limited because you're getting your interest and That's it's right. built in, but it's no more than that. That's right. You don't, you don't take a piece of the action to sweeten no. it. No, I mean, um, I have done that in the past, but not for Atrium. Atrium is designed to use a baseball analogy to hit singles. It's not designed to hit home runs. If we saw a great opportunity to do a transaction that would yield us a 25% annual return, mm -hmm. we might do it, but we'd put together a separate group. We would not put that in Atrium's uh, basket because Atrium's not intending to do that type of, uh, of business. It's designed to have a, a very attractive, a dividend of anywhere from seven and a half to eight eight and a half percent per annum, but not try and take equity risk. And you you built it to hit singles, but it, so, it sounds to me like you don't strike out very often. You have you had failures? Have you had well, we've bad choices. Or? We've done eight hundred and fifty million dollars of business, and we've had total loan losses of seven hundred thousand dollars. So hmm. that's Incredible. better than a financial institution, yeah. I would dare say. Uh, so we've done touch wood really well up till now. We're still trying to be very defensive in what we do. If the market's not there, we don't we don't make the loan. But we're lucky with five offices now. And we went when we went public two years ago. We only had one office. We had an mm -hmm. office in Toronto, and that was it. We now have five offices, with five managing partners running those offices. The volume of business that we can get is more than what we can handle. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the entrepreneurial story, just following the research on your, just on you and on the company, um, it, it is indeed kind of a golden story, a success story, uh, but uh, there's little traces of the standard entrepreneurial struggle because you say at first, my family kicked in the money and they didn't believe in it. They're just doing it, you know, they thought I was you right. know, gonna fail, but they gave me the money anyway. Right. That helped, obviously. Right, uh, when we started, Atrium in 2001 because I did brokerage before and then and then we saw the opportunity to do non-bank lending and started Atrium in 2001. We needed a minimum of 20 investors. That's one of the rules of a mortgage investment corporation. And to get 20 investors, I had to get friends and family and some developers who were loyal to us. I don't think they thought I'd lose their money, but I don't think they thought it would amount to much. I think they just <laughs> thought that I would protect their money, they'd get a decent return and that would be it. And I told them, listen, it's gonna grow slowly. I don't like to grow too quickly. I like to grow cautiously, but it's, it's gonna be a real company. And uh, it feels like a long time, but uh, when I look at how we've progressed, mm -hmm. um, particularly since we went public, we've doubled in assets uh, since September 2012 when we went public. We were 200 million at that point, we're 400 million today. And that's really because when we went public, we in a way became more legitimate and we were able to pull out really outstanding lenders from financial institutions and from other non-bank lenders and offer, offer them attractive deals and the prospect of a, grow, of a real growing company. Maybe even some of the banks where you used to work, no? Uh, not where I used to work, no. <laughs> but, but that kind of <laughs> But that type of bank, yeah. Uh, and and um, it, with these returns that are redistributed quickly, 
um, there's a discipline that's built in such that you probably don't have to worry about analysts trashing you. You're public, but you're not on that roller coaster that some companies are on, where they make a promise, it doesn't happen, they have to explain themselves. You're, you're, feeding, you're feeding the machine immediately. Right. And, and our results are very consistent. So our stock price has a very low beta because uh, you know a, a good quarter for us would be 40, uh, 24 cents and a bad quarter for us would be 22 cents. Mm -hmm. There's not a huge variation in earnings. It's uh, a nickel and dime business. We try to keep our costs very low. By the way, when we went public and we got the shareholder vote to go public in March of 2012, one of my promises to the shareholders was I've always looked after your money. I'm a significant shareholder myself, and this process of going public will not cost you more than $250,000 plus the TSX fee, mm -hmm. which sets some sort of record for cheapest uh, way yeah. of going public. IPO. Yeah. And we managed to accomplish that, and I told them we would handle any cost beyond that. So we've always been a company very concerned about making sure we're not wasting money because we're trying to flow through as much of the mortgage interest income that we collect to the shareholder as we possibly can. Well, one thing that stuns me in this is that you're not commoditized. There's no downward pressure on your, your margin is nice and fat. Uh, but, and, but you would think normally in the normal game of economics, another non-bank lender would come along and, and, and chisel it down. And, and even though your, your clients like you, they say, well, I gotta go to this guy. I mean, I'm gonna pay this much less. It's, you've managed to keep that. Yeah, over 12 years, our average mortgage rate has been a high of 10% and a low of about 8.6%. We're at about 87 now, and it's been consistent for the last year. So we think it's a pretty stable market. We could have more competition, but we seem to have always handled it pretty well because we have more production capability than we have money, which is always a good thing. It's yeah. when you have uh, too much money and you're, 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 you're striving too hard to make deals work that you get yourself into trouble. And no borrower ever says, come on, knock off 2% and you'll still make good money with me. Um, we try to make our deals a little more unique in terms of the structuring. We try to listen to them carefully, sometimes come up with terms and conditions they haven't even thought of that are more appealing to them. Like speed. Speed, but also um, j just upping the loan amount when they've, they, they, when they've accomplished, say, more leasing or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we try to listen carefully we, we might open up the mortgage early to allow them to repay us because they have money coming in from another source. So, so if you're clever with your structuring, then pricing doesn't become as big an issue. And since you were uh, an unlikely entrepreneur, we can say that, as you look back, uh, what do you think? And as you look forward, what do you think? Um, it's the best thing that could have happened to me, but I would say to anybody who's thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, it's not for the faint of heart. It, requires long hours, a huge commitment to the business. Uh, if you're going to build it into something meaningful that will surpass your career. So in the last 20 years, I can honestly say I was the hardest worker in the office and I remain the hardest worker in the office, but it's really rewarding at the end of the day. There are lots of bumps in the road, but it's really rewarding at the end of the day. I wouldn't give it up. I'm lucky that I love what I do. Mm -hmm. So the long hours aren't, aren't too painful for me. Well, Robert Goodall, more power to you. Good luck, long life. Thank you very much.